Well, uh, does anyone have any questions left over from last week? We're coming in with a blank slate this morning and blank minds. Uh, we forget uh, what we actually talked about last week. Okay. Well, let's move on then to what we're looking at this week, which I've already mentioned in my prayer, is the administration of, of the table. And let's look or begin by looking at uh, chapter 29, section 3. Some of this is going to be review, some of it's going to be new. The Lord Jesus has, in his ordinance, appointed his ministers to declare his word of institution to the people, to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine, and thereby to set them apart from a common to a holy use, and to take and break bread, to take the cup, and they communicating also themselves, to give both to the communicants, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. Well, I think uh, the question that this section is answering this morning is how is the supper to be administered? And the first question it answers is who is it that is to minister the table? That's something I think we've already looked at under the sacraments in general, but does anyone remember? <laughs> whether looking or not looking, but who is it that is to administer the sacraments? Is that something that anyone can do at any time? We should be baptizing people that we find along the road that make profession in Christ. Uh, we should be celebrating the Lord's Supper in our, in our homes. What, what exactly um, are the qualifications, or, or who is it that the Lord has set aside to do this? Bridget. Okay. It has to be a minister who's been called by the Lord. And again, it's not because the minister is superior to anyone else. It's not because he's more like Christ, although ideally that should be the case, as, as uh, those that are mature in the faith are to be called to be ministers. But it's because Christ has set apart that individual, uh, that office, to represent himself uh, in the church. Uh, so that when we're having worship, for instance, uh, the minister is the one who is basically standing in in the place of Christ or on the part of God speaking to us through the Word of God and then we respond as uh, members of the body of Christ. And this is one of the things which uh, the sacraments is also uh, showing us. I mean, the minister doesn't give to us the sacraments. And it's not because they, they come from his hand that there is anything special about them. But Christ is the one who's giving them to us. And Christ has appointed someone to represent him in that transaction whether it be in the reading of the word, in the preaching of the word, or leading us in prayer, or in the administration of the sacraments. Uh, we have the reminder in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4, with regard to the priesthood, and no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So the one who would take this particular role has to be authorized by Christ to represent him Again, because he is the one who is giving to us this uh, sign and seal. He is the one who is uh, uh, sealing this grace to us through the sacrament. He's the one making the promise. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Greg? Does the confession draw a distinction between minister on the one hand and elders on the other? Or? Does the confession do that? Right. <laughs> or would it encompass elders among those deemed to be ministers of the gospel? Well, I'm sorry, that's right, I should repeat the question. He asked the question um, whether the confession is making a distinction here between ministers and elders in the administration of the table. And I don't know that it's making it here, but it may in other places, or it may in the Book of Church Order certainly does make a distinction. However, in this denomination that follows that same distinction of teaching and ruling elders, the ruling elders actually do, uh, they don't, they, they don't um, administer the table, but they serve, in which case they are also representing Christ. I do think that that distinction, though, is a, is a false distinction, a false dichotomy. I don't think that there really should be a distinction between a teaching and ruling elder. The elder are those who uh, are, are basically ministers of the Word, and they all represent Christ. But in our denomination, we have a three-office view. And in the three-office view, the teaching elder would be the one who would represent, at least verbally, what Christ is saying. The ruling elders would, um, would also help carry that will out and rule in the church, but they wouldn't primarily be teachers, which uh, when you understand the Lord's Supper as a visible word, which is what we're going to look at next, 
and see it as an administration of the words, uh, they would be the ones primarily that would do that and the ruling elders not. But again, I, I don't think that the scriptures give us that distinction. Tom? Of, of all of the uh, sermons that are urgent throughout the uh, Old Priest, they say that only elders are qualified to give uh, When you say elders of the church, are you talking about of the local church? Yeah, this church. Okay, versus the teaching elders who would be basically elders of the presbytery? Is that the distinction no, you're I'm making? That okay. The, the, the pastor is the one who sets it up. Like when you say, uh, well, the elders come up. Yes. And uh, I'm saying that only the elders have that, that capacity that right to give. That, that is the view in the OPC, oh, that, yes, that, that they... That's, that, that what you're saying? That, yeah. that, that's what I'm saying, yes. That it has to be administered by an elder, somebody who is set apart to represent Christ. Kathy? Tom, are you, are you asking what, whether the, the pastor is an elder? No, I... I, no, no, I no. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know exactly where the question was going, so that's why I asked if that's what that was. But no, you're just talking about, do they have to be an elder? Yes. Yes, they do. Okay, so um, in, in the view, of course, of the OPC, all, all ministers would be elders, and I suppose in some sense all the elders, the ruling elders, would also be ministers, but I don't think in, in this sense. I think Westminster is actually saying here that it should be the teaching elder. That would be the one who's typically thought of as the pastor. But I do believe the scriptures uh, don't really give us that distinction, although the Puritans strongly believe that. Yes? I'm a little bit confused. Um, are we talking about a great expression is if you're not here, or is it the elders that come in and pass it down the aisle? Well, I, I believe Greg was asking whether Westminster believed that ruling elders would, would be able to administer the table. Are you familiar with that distinction between teaching and ruling elder? in the OPC. The teaching elder is the one who goes to seminary and, and the one who uh, goes through the battery of exams at Presbytery and is ordained there. And ruling elders are the ones that, that are called by the congregation uh, from amongst their number and uh, examined and ordained here. And that's based on this distinction that, that some of the elders, uh, well, the, the scriptures tell us that there's a distinction between them. There are some who give themselves to teaching and some that give themselves to ruling. Um, and that there's two different types of elders with two different qualifications. Uh, but I believe the Bible really teaches there's only one. I think Greg was asking whether or not Westminster saw that distinction and is talking about the teaching elder here versus the ruling elder. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. But again, I believe the Bible teaches us that it's the elders who are to do this and that that distinction really shouldn't exist between teaching and ruling elders. I do believe a church ought to have a plurality of elders, but that uh, the, the scripture actually says that passage in 1 Timothy 5, let, let the, rule, the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those that work hard at teaching and preaching. It's not making a distinction between there are some that rule and some that teach, but it says those who rule well, you know, that is that who are good at that, who, who give themselves to that, ought to be considered worthy of double honor. And especially among those elders, those that give themselves to teaching and preaching, they, they should be considered worthy of double honor as well. It's not saying that there are only some who only teach and some who only rule. And even in our denomination, they recognize that ruling elders teach and that teaching elders rule, but that there's, they do more of one than the other and are giving themselves more to one than to the other. But I think it's talking about from among these that rule well and who teach, you know, work hard at that. They're to be considered worthy of double honor. They all have the same, there's only one set of qualifications for an elder in the scripture. Uh, so they all have to meet that qualification, which means they all need to be able to do both of those things, ruling and teaching. But the question is, are they doing it well and are they working hard at it? Bridget. The table? You know, that you give out the elements and, you know, talk about 
about it and everything. Because like I said, I told you before, so I never knew that if you took the elements and you would sit, sit and you bring some um, wrap upon yourself. And, and no one ever told me that until I became a reformed person. And the Catholic Church, they they let, you know, just anybody give out the elements, you know, and they can go to hospitals or give them out. So that's just, you know, I, I think that's not safer than you just let anybody do it. Well, that, that's interesting. So you're saying, well, you're saying that, that uh, we should see it as sacred and that we need to treat it as holy, and of course because of the discipline, but that the Roman Church doesn't do that. Now, if they let just anybody administer it, they must have a priest somewhere who, who consecrates it. Your sister-in-law. I do the Eucharist, you know, and she goes to hospital and people who are sick, you know, because he can't be everywhere, so she goes and does it for him. And he doesn't. And the Presbyterian Church too does it. Well, no, the, the priest, I mean, the, whatever the pastor does it. Yeah. Okay. I, I would imagine if, if they followed through with their theology in the Catholic Church, they would have to have a priest at least consecrate them and have them yeah. on hand. And then, and then give it to the person to give it out. But even that would be improper. Yes, right. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. This generated some discussion this time around that it did last time. So I guess we, we thought about it a little bit, or at least uh, something's been going on in our minds in the background. Okay. Now, how is the minister to minister the sacraments? And, and here are the things that we need to be aware of as we're actually celebrating the Lord's Supper. If we are to get uh, the, the symbolism and the benefits, okay? First of all, the minister is to read the word of institution. And, and why do you think that he needs to read the word of institution? Why do we need to hear that every time that we have the Lord's Supper? Well, that's, that's a very important reason. Needs, the table needs to be guarded. We need to read the warning. That's very important. But uh, with regard to the other parts of, um, of what we read, why do we read the part that explains what it's about? It, it's not like an automatic blessing <laughs> to just receive the elements. There's, it, it is a, a pictorial um, observation, it's pictorial teaching. It's the word in the picture form. Okay. And we need, we need it explained and interpreted to us. Okay, that, that's, that's very important. The, the sacrament is a picture to us. But unless it's explained, we don't know what the picture means. I mean, think about this. Let's think about the, the Lord's Supper, let's say, or the Passover meal, first institution. Jesus takes some bread and he begins to break it and he hands it out to his disciples and he sits there and he doesn't say anything. You know, what are the disciples going to gather from that? And then he hands them the cup. Well, I guess Jesus wants us to drink, but he wants us to eat. But, but why? Why are you doing this? You know, I mean, Jesus doesn't leave them in the dark. Jesus explains it, right? So it has to be explained to us, otherwise we don't know what it means. Sometimes it may seem superfluous because we've heard it so many times, I think we know what it means by now, and maybe that would be an argument for not having to read the word of institution each time, but yet there's, maybe there's something we're, we're missing and it needs to be explained. And so, you know, again, it's, we need to hear the word of God explain it so that our faith will have something to grab onto. Okay? So here's examples of that very thing in Scripture. Obviously, there's... there's um, two here where the Lord, when he's instituting it. Uh, Matthew 26, 26 through 28, I'll just read one of these. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had given or taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And if we go to... Um, the, uh, the bottom one where Paul, in C that is, 1 Corinthians 11, the one we typically read, Paul is also explaining it to the Corinthians. You know, they need to know what it means, otherwise it is a mute, it's a mute word. It's a visible word, and it actually speaks when we know what it means, but uh, unless the Word of God explains it, we, we really wouldn't know. But uh, he gives a fuller explanation here, and if we go down to the bottom, he says, uh, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And of course, if we went into 1 Corinthians 10, we'd also see that there is a communion that is going on between us and the Lord and between all of us as members of the body of Christ. And that, that will be important when we come to the symbolism that's involved here. 
But the word of institution is read so that the sacrament is explained because without the explanation we don't know what it means. It's, it's a word, it's a visible word, but it's, it's a mute word. The, um, uh, you might say you have to have the directions that come with it, the instructions, otherwise you, you really don't know what it is. Okay, so it's to be administered by a minister, the minister is to read the uh, word of institution. And then thirdly, and this was something that um, I'm not sure that I, I, f I would fully understand, and it looks to me like um, there may even be some uh, question as to what this actually means in the minds of, of expositors of the confession. I don't know if you noticed what it, what it says in uh, section 3 here regarding blessing the elements. Blessing the elements. Notice that the minister is to declare the word of institution to the people to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine. Okay, what does it mean to bless the elements? We understand that what prayer is all about. Okay, but What does it mean to bless the elements? Okay, Well, one thing we do know is that it's done through prayer. And we also know that it entails something that what Bridget has already brought up. This is a holy table. But when does it become the holy table? Okay, what, what point does it become holy? Okay, now we need to understand what this means. We need to understand what it doesn't mean, right? Uh, when the when we bring the bread and the wine up here, let's say somebody somebody comes in off the street and we don't happen to notice him. He comes up to the front, and happens to sneak out one of the cups of wine, and takes a piece of bread and and he he gets out and he goes somewhere and he eats it. Okay, is he eating and drinking judgment to himself? But you, you're thinking yes? Yes, because he's read that. You know, and, of course, he doesn't know, so you know, maybe, maybe he gets away with it that way. <laughs> well, okay. But you know, ignorance is no excuse, is it? <laughs> if, it's, if it's a great news, he's okay. <laughs> okay. Because he never really took one of the elements, right? <laughs> okay. Greg? But if that were true, then um, if he went up to the storehouse, on the balcony now and took one of the, the bottles of wine from up there and drank some of that, you'd be in the same predicament. Okay. It has to be a point in time when something sets it apart. Okay. Now, Greg was saying that if that, if that were true, then if he, if he went up and took, let's say, where we keep the wine, took one of the bottles <laughs> and made off with it and drank it, he'd be doing the same thing. Or if he went into the freezer and got one of those uh, wafers of bread and ate that. The, the question is, when does it actually become the holy table? Right? It's not when we purchase the, the wafers from the store in order to uh, set them aside for that purpose, even though that's what we're going to do with it, or when we buy the wine, right? But it's going to be that prayer of consecration, okay? And that's, I think, what is in, in the mind of the, uh, uh, of the assembly here when they're talking about praying and blessing the elements of bread and wine. When, when that has happened, then the table becomes the table, as it were and the elements have been set apart from common use to sacred use or to holy use before they're administered. At that point, if somebody comes during that administration or in this case they don't have to come, but if they're served and they participate in those things, not having faith, not being believers, then that warning of eating and drinking judgment is valid, okay? But not until the time that those elements are set aside and I think that's what's being referred to here. We could get a little bit confused here by this idea of blessing the elements, you know, that's, uh, yes, Bridget. Well, first of all, if you do this, you're going to without asking, you're still there. Okay. <laughs> and they would be increasing their judgment by doing that, right. But, but the first, I guess I'm kind of getting on the topics, but I remember when I was in church, I didn't really fully understand all the elements of the sacred because I didn't really understand the elements of the sacred because he would open it up and say whatever he says and give out a little box and give all this stuff that they do, you know. I never understood it, but I, you know, I just did it because that's what they do. But when they gives it to you, the one thing that they said, I think was like, you know, oh, you better not do that, you know, is, is don't you put your hands like this when you really drop one piece of glass bottle, you know, out of your mouth or anything, you know. So they made it like really, really, really sacred to the one. So that's why I, that I got out of all of that. Right. You know, the, uh, when we go on a little bit further here, we'll talk about the one loaf image. Jesus takes bread and he breaks it. They actually... They actually use a compressed wafer that doesn't flake so you can't lose the, the pieces. Uh, but 
as you understand also the the uh, the Catholic or the Roman the Roman Catholic view of of the supper and of the elements, they do believe that that's his actual body and blood, which is why they're holding them up to be venerated and why they treat it as sacred. Uh, we're we're saying that once once we once the minister has prayed and asked the Lord to set these things aside, they they now have a particular use which is sacred. They don't necessarily contain anything. Nothing's been changed, but now they have been set apart for this use. And if anyone comes in you, it, to the table under those pretenses and doesn't have faith, that's when they fall under the, that condemnation. Okay, so there's really, you, you wouldn't say it's because the, the elements themselves have some kind of virtue in and of themselves, some kind of power, but they have been set apart from common use to holy use. When that happened, even in the temple service, the, the nature, let's say, of a, of a pan or a pot that was set apart that became holy, that could only be used in the temple, the nature of that pot was still the same. It's just that it had been set apart, and if you used it for anything else, then God would, would judge you for that. When uh, Belteshazzar or uh, Belshazzar uh, said, bring the vessels from the temple that we took from Jerusalem, and let's use these things to, to uh, worship our God by getting drunk and drinking out of them, that was a wrong thing to do, because those were holy vessels. Uh, there was nothing different about them at all except that God had set them apart and, and they had been anointed with, with uh, that oil, I think it was, or uh, to, to set those things apart. I, I think that was the case. I think everything was cleansed by that or set apart by that. So are you saying you take sin upon yourself for doing that? It, you take sin upon yourself for doing that? You mean if the, if the person drinks... Yeah, you would sin by doing that, yes. Um, as you saw in the temple service too, when was it uh, the two sons of Aaron decided they would do something innovative? Whenever you do something with what is holy that God has not warranted, that is very a very dangerous, very sinful thing. And in those days, the Lord would often simply kill them on the spot. See, and Belshazzar was actually killed for that. Yes. You talked about when it becomes set apart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think once, you I mean, when does it then cease to be holy? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah I think it would have to be after the, after the table is served and whatever's left over is, we've, we've already done what we're going to do with, with, with it. I, I guess you would say the rest of it is not necessarily holy. It's not going to be used for that. And we understand there's going to be leftovers. But I, I think, um, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, the priest has to consume them all. Uh, thankfully, we don't have to do that. But uh, we, we do need to be careful that... Um, uh, we don't keep things too long, too, we've discovered. that. <laughs> Otherwise, even holy grape juice can uh, deteriorate. And <laughs> so I would imagine once its purpose is completed, that it's no longer to be considered holy. Once the service of the table is over, uh, it's what we are doing with it that makes a difference, not what it is, okay, or even the quantity. Oh, we're going to get to that. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a very good question, yes. Uh, that's one that, that is important, very important, that I think is overlooked um, in so many different churches. Okay, well, at least we understand, I think, now the word of institution. We're looking at the uh, praying and blessing. Let me just read this section out of Shaw, and you'll see something of, of the um, difficulty in understanding this. This is the, begins at the bottom of page one. In instituting this sacrament, according to the evangelist Matthew, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. I'm just going to update some of the language here. Matthew 26:26. 26, 26. Some have observed that it is not necessary, excuse me, not necessary for us to understand this as signifying that Jesus blessed the bread, for the pronoun it is a supplement. He blessed it. Uh, and the word rendered blessed sometimes means to give thanks. Thanks especially as the evangelist Luke employs the phrase, he gave thanks. Uh, when you look at the parallel passage in the book of Luke, it doesn't say that Jesus blessed the bread, but it says he gave thanks and then he broke it. Uh, they conclude that the two expressions are in this case synonymous and that we are to understand that Jesus blessed not the bread, but God, or gave thanks to, the, to his Father. We are of, uh, I think there should be a the in there, we are of the opinion, however, that the pronoun it has been very properly introduced by our translators after the word bread, as it unquestionably, as it is unquestionably repeated with the utmost propriety after the word broke. And we conceive that the order of the word requires us to understand that Jesus blessed the bread. Nor is there any more difficulty in apprehending how Jesus blessed the bread than in apprehending how God blessed the seventh or the Sabbath day. Indeed, the two cases are exactly analogous. 
God blessed the seventh day by setting it apart to a holy use or appointing it to be a day of sacred rest. Christ blessed the bread by setting it apart from a common to a holy use or appointing it to be the visible symbol of his body. And while it belonged exclusively to Christ as the head of the church to appoint bread and wine to be the symbols of his body and blood, yet we are persuaded that the servants of Christ in administering the Lord's Supper are warranted according to the institution and example of Christ to set apart by solemn prayer so much of the elements as shall be used from a common to a holy use. That there is a sense in which the servants of Christ may be said to bless the elements seems plain from 1 Corinthians 10:16, where Paul denominates the, sa the sacramental cup the cup of blessing which we bless. It is not pretended that any real change is thereby made upon the elements, but only a relative change so that they are not to be looked upon as common bread and wine, but as the sacred symbols of Christ's body and blood. I think that's what we've seen so far. Uh, you can see that there's some debate within these circles as to what exactly it means to bless the bread. Is it thanking God for the bread, or is it asking God to set these things apart? But I, I think you also recognize if we did take it in the sense of just giving thanks to God, uh, we still need to realize that in the administration of the table there is something going on there that is different and if somebody who isn't a worthy recipient takes it there then he falls under that judgment that is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 11 but if he takes it at any other time he's only guilty of stealing. And there's a big difference between the two. I'd much rather steal than take from the table when I shouldn't be taking from the table. Okay. So at least though we see that at the table that is set apart and becomes the Lord's supper and it becomes something holy that must be used for that purpose and if we unworthy participants or we use it for some other purpose uh, we fall under that condemnation okay all right all right and then we get on to the sacramental actions uh, symbols uh, what it is the minister is supposed to do uh, to uh, help us understand this or to actually bring across the, the symbolism that the Lord Jesus Christ meant to bring across First of all, the minister is to break the bread. And why do you think the minister is to break the bread? <laughs> There's maybe an obvious reason for it, maybe a, a less obvious reason, yes. Uh, because, because what? Because Christ, Christ's body was broken, okay? That's, that is the symbolism there. Now, um, it is interesting that um, uh, his body wasn't literally broken in one sense, but as bread he, is, he becomes the bread of life and is broken and so forth, and, and yes, that's, that symbolism is present, and that's the important, one of the important things. Jerry? I was just going to say, in answer to the question, because Christ broke the That's correct. I mean, Jesus did tell us that um, you know, we are to observe this, and the way that, that we are to do it is, is how he gave us the example, and Jesus took some bread and he broke it, and he says, this is my body, and Paul goes on, you know, this is my body which is broken for you. Actually, Jesus says that. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. So, it is a symbol of his body. Now, think about this in terms of how, we are sort of picking on the Roman church or the Roman way of doing things. That, <laughs> but do they, do they break the bread? Uh, no. No. Oh. That's right. Now Jesus here didn't uh, have it all pre-done, right? And uh, he didn't compress them especially into wafers so that crumbs would not be lost because this was his body and so forth and, and it's so holy and sacred we can't lose any of it. But he took, I think, a common loaf and he began breaking pieces off of it and was giving it to them. So the idea of breaking is important. Uh, it, it's basically the symbol or figure of his body which is broken, wounded, bruised, crucified to atone for our sins. One thing that Shaw points out is an unbroken Christ would not benefit us. So we need to see in this the symbolism of Christ's sacrifice for us. And, and again, you, you see the, uh, the, the comment here to use preformed wafers as Rome does to represent his body without breaking contradicts what it is to symbolize. Now there, of course, their concern is we don't lose the crumbs, but Jesus' concern is that it be broken. Okay? But they, they change it in other ways too, is which we're going to see. Really, really 
That's right. We, we need to make sure that we treat it as what it is, which is holy. In other words, saying that it is sacred. Uh, Kathy? The, um, symbolism also perhaps, maybe, I, I guess I'm not sure how to word this, but, but demonstrate that, again, we are one body in, in Christ. And we are all partakers of His body. And it would be more of a symbol of, of the body of Christ in its unity also. Right. I'm, let me just see if we, we get... Actually, I don't think we did get into that, but that is uh, something that is important. We're talking now about breaking the bread is to symbolize his body, which is broken, but the one loaf is meant to symbolize the fact that, that Christ has one body, and we are members of that body. I've, I've mentioned that before. I, I think I told you one time we, we sought to implement that imagery by breaking one piece of bread in order you know, one of those unleavened wafers. To, to give that symbolism, we found at the time that one wasn't enough to go around, so we uh, couldn't find a larger size, so we took two of them and put them together and made them look like one, and then you know, broke them all together. Uh, but some people just couldn't process that much information, uh, didn't know what to do when the thing came around, how big a piece they should break off, or if it's too big or too small, and we're, we're panicking over things that, that were really irrelevant. The important thing is that you break a piece off and, and, and so forth. But uh, maybe what, what should more accurately happen, since Christ was the one who, who broke it all, is it should all be broken right there, and then we just simply take pieces out. Greg? I was going to add to, to Kathy's point that the, the fact that the, the meal proclaims that you are one body is exactly the reason that judgment came upon the church of Corinth and that Paul rebukes them, hmm. because they weren't they were taking a meal that professed their unity in Christ and, and yet turning it into a, a fiasco where people weren't being fed and others were having too much. Right. That's right. The, the idea of what he was saying was that the church in Corinth came under judgment actually for not, not recognizing that oneness in Christ by some abusing the table, some getting drunk and becoming gluttons while others were going without and so forth. So they were violating that principle even while seeking to demonstrate that principle and, and the Lord was bringing judgment on them. Kathy? This may not be related, but I just, I love the way partaking by eating and how similar that is to, to a picture, what faith is, partaking by faith. It, it seems like there's a strong correlation to me. Christ even talks about faith as feeding on him, doesn't he? Um, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And Jesus isn't talking about the literal eating that Roman church, or, you know, the Romanists or the Lutherans believe that there's an actual literally, you know, literal eating of his flesh and blood, but it's symbolic of faith feeding upon Christ. And I think I told you about, uh, and I should, I should bring that um, uh, to maybe to the next time when, when we're uh, looking at this, how uh, I think it was either Heidelberg or Belgic Confession talks about the mouth of faith feeding upon Christ. And the imagery there sounds kind of strange. If you come from this, from a, a broad evangelical view and you're trying to, to understand this position and you read that and you're still trying to separate that from eating, literally eating his flesh and blood, the mouth of faith feeding upon Christ, his body and his blood. And I was thinking, are we really um, different than Rome here, you know? So it, it um, but I, when I came to understand exactly what they meant by that, then I saw there was a difference. But when you're first coming in, it's hard to see that distinction. Okay, all right. So, breaking of the bread, very important. And I, one other note that I make here is that in the scriptures, oftentimes the, uh, the phrase, the breaking of the bread, is used simply to refer to the Lord's Supper. And that means that, what do you call that? Is that a synecdoche? Is that, is that what you call it? Where you take a part for the whole, you take one part of it, and it actually represents the whole thing. When they talk about breaking the bread, they're not saying just the bread. It's actually the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The cup is involved, but they use just that phrase to describe it. Okay? And, and what the, the point behind this was, if you use that phrase, breaking the bread, to describe the Lord's Supper, then breaking the bread must be very important to the Lord's Supper. You want to make sure you break bread when, when it happens. So, uh, again, the idea is that that is a part of, uh, of the service of the table. It has to be done. We don't want to have a, a service where there's no bread broken. Okay? All right. And then the minister is to take the cup, which represents the blood, and give both elements uh, to the communicants. Now, why would, we, why would Westminster have to say that in that section where it says uh, they take and break the bread to take the cup and 
they communicating also themselves to give both to the communicants. Well, why is it important that Westminster say that both have to be given to the communicants? Isn't that obvious? Didn't Jesus give both to his disciples? Why would they have to say that? That's right. The Roman Church is now withholding one, and which which one is that? One, well, one withholding. One. Have they given the other one back to him? No, actually, they don't sometimes drink out of one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We we actually had a discussion about that when I was at Trinity PCA. Uh, Joey wanted to use uh, Joey Piper, the pastor, wanted to use a common cup, and he was under the impression that uh, the alcohol and the wine would kill any bacteria that would get in in there. And uh, we we had on our on our session a man whose uh, job it was to sterilize things in hospitals. And uh, he said, uh, <laughs> there's not enough alcohol in there to, to kill the bacteria or the virus, and uh, we would be communicating in more than just uh, the, the Lord's uh, body and blood if we did that. So anyway, so we decided not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But uh, as you already said, the, the Church of Rome did withhold the, uh, the cup, beginning, I believe, in uh, the, the Council of Constance. So for the first 1,400 years, the Church was receiving both the, the bread and the wine. By the way, I keep saying bread and wine. Is there anything wrong with that? Bread and wine? Is there anything wrong with bread and grape juice? Yeah. <laughs> it's not fermented, right? Okay. Uh, bread and wine is what the Lord used. Okay, He used bread and wine. And what kind of bread did He use? Unleavened bread. Right. You think that's important? If we say it's not important, what are our grounds for saying it's not important? Right. Oftentimes, you'll find in communion services, though, it's not unleavened bread that's being used. Right. When I first came here, it was not unleavened bread that was being used. Right. It doesn't understanding the symbolism that was present in the Passover meal and the fact that yeast had to be out of it, if you're now taking that and making it not representative or making it representative of the body of Christ who was pure and sinless, you have to preserve that symbolism and understand it. Right. Greg's point is, is well taken. What he's saying is that um, in the Passover meal, the leaven was not to be in the bread because it was representing the absence of sin, that, that we were called to be sinless and we were to eat the Passover without sin. And if leaven was found anywhere, in, in your house during the Passover, I think you would be cut off of, out of Israel. Now, isn't it just as important when we're ser celebrating the Lord's Supper and to have a piece of bread representing the body of Christ that it not have leaven in it? Because leaven is representative of what? Sin. And is, is Christ leavened? Obviously not. So that symbolism was pointing to the sinless body of Christ, right? So now that, that he is, ha has changed this to be more explicitly him, should we change it to be leavened bread? I think also, aside from the very simple point, if Christ uses something and says, do this, should we do something else? Should we replace it with, with you know, Coke? Or should we replace the bread with potato chips? I've heard some speakers say, it doesn't matter. You know, you can use whatever, whatever's at hand. And you'll even find in, in Hodge, at least in uh, AA Hodge, that Jesus used common bread and if we use our common bread, that's fine. Our common bread is leaven, so that's okay. But Jesus wasn't using just common bread. He was using the unleavened bread of the Passover. So I think to argue that he just used common table bread would be wrong to begin with. And that would lead you to the false conclusion. What's that? Uh, his blood. <laughs> well, why did he choose... Wine. I think I think often in Scripture the the uh, juice of grapes is is symbolic of blood, and um, it certainly has that visually, doesn't it? Um, I know Joey also had uh, Joey Piper went maybe a little bit deeper than you often see in um, Reformed theology, but he believed that Jesus purposely chose these things, and that we'd have to say the Lord purposely chose the symbols He did at the Passover, since Christ would later take those and bring them into you know, the, their new covenant significance. But he chose the elements that he did because of their sensibility. We talk about sensible signs um, that, that are visible to our senses. And he, he believed that unleavened bread would be 
more present to our senses than leavened bread, and certainly wine would be than grape juice. But the other thing we have to reckon with is how long does it take for grape juice to turn into wine, and that was the common drink of the day. Um, and certainly it was what was instituted at uh, the Passover, but I believe it was common table wine that was used. That was a very common thing to drink, and they didn't have refrigeration, and, and maybe Greg could tell us how long it would, it would keep without fermenting, but oftentimes it was fermented even in the grape before they actually squeezed it. It, it starts as soon as you crush the grapes because the yeast is already on the skins. Uh, so it starts fermenting as soon as they're crushed. The yeast is just waiting to get to that, uh, that sugar inside and to begin eating it and fermenting it. But to go back to the imagery, the, the grape has to be crushed, it has to be trampled. There's that idea of treading the wine press of God's wrath and so on, and that's when the blood of the grape comes out. Right. The, the grapes in that case were used, uh, he was saying that when God's judgment is, uh, is symbolized, oftentimes it's, it's grapes being put into the wine press and trampled and then the, the, the blood of the grape comes out to, re to represent God's wrath and that's you know, when he's bringing judgment against the nation and talking about how the blood is going to flow in that way. So uh, just the idea that, that the juice of grapes is often used to be representative of blood and that's a good reason why it might be at the table in the first place both in the Passover and, and in the Lord's Supper. The juice of grapes representing the blood of Christ, which is poured out, and God's wrath is poured out on him. It's spilled so that we might uh, be forgiven. Jack? Now, the yeast was represented sin in the bread, so that's why they left. Yes. It was unleavened. Yes. So then the yeast that makes it into wine, where it's poured out, is pouring out of sin. Well, I, not, I don't think that the yeast being in the wine is representative of anything. I think in that case, they really don't have any control over that. Um, I don't think they had to add yeast. I don't think they could cultivate yeast in those days. It would seem unlikely. It wouldn't have to be added, in it? depending on how they treated the wine, it may not be in the wine. Anymore. And yet, they must have had leaven because they leavened bread. So, they're, But whether they used that in their, in their yeast or their wine production, I don't think they did. I think it just fermented by itself. They may not have even understood the correlation between it, since they didn't have, uh, you know, Gallo in those days. And <laughs> <laughs> well, even today, the, the purest winemakers would rather allow a fermentation just to happen than to add a yeast to it to make it happen. It works better that way. It works better if the, if the yeast gets in naturally rather than adding it, or just they would they would prefer it though. But it's, it's a kind of purest philosophy. Oh, I see. To go back to the old ways of doing it rather than to do it the modern way. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. But let's now get on to why the cup was, or at least that the cup was taken away from the people. If you look at the top of page three at the Council of Constance, and this again comes from Shaw's The Reformed Faith, which is a commentary on the Confession of Faith. The Council of Constance decreed that though Christ did administer this venerable sacrament to his disciples under both the kinds of bread and wine, Yet notwithstanding this, the custom of communicating under one kind only is now to be taken for a law. Is there a problem with that? Jesus instituted it this way, but now the law is it's going to be this way. And it's going to be instead of two, it's only going to be one. Okay. And they also said, though in the primitive church the sacrament was received by the faithful under both kinds, yet notwithstanding this, the custom that is introduced of communicating under one kind only for the laity, not for the clergy, but for the laity, is now to be taken for a law. The Council of Trent, which was later, I think I get the dates of the Council of Constance were 1414 to 1418, and Trent would have been around, I think it was 1560s. Trent says uh, that the laity and the clergy not officiating are not bound by any divine precept to receive the sacrament of the Eucharist under both kinds. And further declares that although our Redeemer in the Last Supper instituted the sacrament in two kinds and so delivered it to the apostles, yet under one kind only, whole and entire Christ and the true sacrament are taken, and that therefore those who receive only one kind are deprived of no grace necessary to salvation. The Church of Rome, it will be remarked, acknowledges both kinds, the bread and the wine, to have been instituted by Christ, and the ordinance to have been thus celebrated in primitive times. She is therefore guilty of an avowed opposition to the authority of Christ, 
has sacrilegiously mutilated this holy sacrament and infringed the privileges of the Christian people. The command of Christ to drink the wine is as express as the command to eat the bread. Nay, as foreseen how in after ages this ordinance would be dismembered by the prohibition of the cup to the laity, he is even more explicit in his injunction concerning the cup than the bread. Of the bread, he, he simply said, take, eat, but when he gave the cup, he said, drink ye all of it. I'm not sure if I get that point, but um, you can see that he's still correct overall. According to the divine institution, therefore, both the elements are to be given to all the communicants. And as really as the bread and wine are given to the communicants, so Christ gives himself with all his benefits to the worthy receivers, and in taking these elements and eating the bread and drinking the wine, they profess to receive Christ by faith and to rest their hope of pardon and salvation solely upon his death. Okay. So anyway, the idea is Christ instituted both, but the church has at least um, in 1414, it was still one church overall, except, let's see, except for the Eastern Church, which separated around the 10, I think it was 1054. But they took away the cup from the laity, but not from the clergy. Clergy still took it. By the way, I should mention too that um, the uh, just just from um, knowing a, a friend of mine who uh, at one time was being drawn into the Eastern Orthodox Church and was trying to learn more about it. He liked the idea of infallibility. I mean, who wouldn't like the idea if it were true? If there were a, an infallible body with an infallible interpretation of Scripture, that would be nice because then you couldn't be wrong. And he was thinking that they might have that infallible interpretation because they were a continuance of the, of, uh, of, of the church, supposedly, from the very beginning. Okay? Now, some of the things that started to give him some pause to go in was the celebration of the Lord's Supper when uh, the priest mentioned a couple of things that uh, really turned him off towards them. Uh, the first one was uh, taking the... Uh, you know, it was really a gross example, but the priest was boasting about another priest that he knew who was such a holy man because when he, he gave the, uh, the, actually they were giving the bread and wine both to a communicant, the communicant being sick on that day actually threw it up and the priest actually cleaned it up but he did it by eating it, okay? And that, that's very, uh, very disgusting but he thought that was a very righteous and holy thing. I, I don't know why he thought he could keep it down but um, anyway, <laughs> that's crazy, Greg. I wonder that, that part of Shaw that is hard to explain. I've heard it said that an understanding of that those words, drinking all of it, had to do with the quantity rather than you know, drink from it all of you, meaning everyone should take it. Right. But rather drink all of this wine that is here. And he may be understanding it in that sense, and maybe Rome did as well, which is why they didn't see that it was a specific problem to deny it to the laity. But rather, the, the imperative was that all of the consecrated wine should be consumed. Okay, so you're saying because it all had to be consumed versus the bread where you may only just take a bite, that that's more intense, and that would be, Christ is sort of singling that out for a little bit more, um, a little bit more than the other. Okay. I think we generally understand it, each of you. Actually, it reminds me of, a, of a, a teacher that I had in college where he was at a communion service and they were using a common cup. And uh, the, the command, he was the first one to be served. I think they were at a table. And he says, the guy handed to him, the, the minister handed to him and said, drink ye all of it. <laughs> and he drank all of it. <laughs> and there was nothing left for anyone else. <laughs> Well, that is, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why priests were having difficulty with al alcoholism because uh, I think they would kind of estimate how many people, actually, why would they have to, if they're, if they're the only ones drinking the wine, why would they have to take any more than what they need? I, I don't know. But I do remember, at, at, maybe they had given, when did the cup come back? When did they start giving the cup again? 
And how long ago was that? Okay, well that would explain then why the problem exists today, because they do estimate. I remember I was at a, um, a, a wedding where uh, there was a Catholic gal who was marrying uh, basically a person who was nothing, as far as, well, he, you know, at least for what he professed. And as a part of the service, they were going to have Mass, <clears throat> and the priest who was officiating looked at all the people there and thought there were probably a lot of good Catholics out there who would like Mass, and so he consecrates a whole bunch of stuff. And then when just a handful of people came up, he was faced with, <laughs> he had two, <laughs> looked like two rows of these wafers, you know, that, that he had consecrated, and he had, you know, a, maybe a, a, a bottle of wine, at least. And we had to, there was at least a, a ten minute pause during the service for him to, to eat all of that bread and drink all that wine, you know, before we could move on. And he kept taking them up and eating them and, you know, wiping his cup and drinking and he'd take some more and we just had to sit there and wait for him to finish before, you know, things could proceed. I'm not sure what that uh, did to him the rest of the day, but anyway, um, yeah. And I, I, was, I was going to mention, too, that the other thing that, that uh, was a uh, sort of a, uh, uh, something that, that gave my friend pause about going into the, the Eastern Orthodox Church was um, the, uh, the priest told him that they had actually in the Eastern Orthodox Church found a better way to administer the table than the Lord had actually instituted and what they would do is they would put the bread into the wine and then they would scoop it out with a spoon and then they would put it into the into the recipient's mouth so I guess you might say they had a common cup and they had a common spoon okay but uh, the idea is that with that wine now saturating the bread it can't crumble and and uh, fall off so uh, nothing's lost see uh, but my friend asked the question um, what if somebody a priest in the Orthodox Church administered the table in the way that Christ instituted it. And the priest said, with, with, um, uh, he was almost triumphantly saying, well, that priest would be excommunicated. You mean if he did it the way Christ instituted, he'd be kicked out of the church? Yes, because he'd be going against what the church says. Okay, well, you know, what would you think of that? <laughs> I can't do it the way Christ did it. I have to do it the way the church says, and if I do it the way Christ says, then, then that's it for me. Okay. Well, obviously that is problematic, but if you, if you have a view that you can alter what Jesus says, if you have a patriarch who, uh, I, don't, they don't, I don't think they have the chair of Peter, but I'm um, not sure exactly how their infallibility works, or if they even claim infallibility, do you, do you know it's, there's a difference there? Um, but they do believe that that's the way it needs to be done, because that's the way they decided to do it. So, so they must have a, an authority that trumps that of Christ. Okay, the last thing here, and I guess we're not going to get to the frequency until next week because we, we do want to uh, try to end on time. Let me just end with this, that the, this section says that uh, they are to give the bread and the cup to themselves as well as to the communicants, but to none who are not then present in the congregation. Why is it important that if we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper that we be present here? and that we don't take it other places afterwards, as was mentioned a little bit earlier. Donna? Well, I'm not going to say that Mary is the word, the meaning of the word, and all of this, that, and it's all proclaiming Christ, because it's a visual picture of Christ. Okay. As, we, as we've already seen, there has to be the word to explain the, the visible word, and they haven't had the word of institution. Okay, that, that's one, one important reason. Kathy, did you have another, or was that the same one you were thinking of? Can you think of any other reason why? Donna? The, the symbolism of the body, private communion. You know, how can you have private communion? Because communion is not just with Christ, but it's with one another. And both are taking place, and both are important. If you look at point two under here, one of the purposes of the table is to remind us that we are in communion with one another as members of Christ's body. To celebrate it alone is a contradiction. That's why at Joey Pipus Church, and, and we would do the same thing here, at least we, we did after it was corrected, um, we wouldn't just take it out to the, to the nursery. As a matter of fact, that's what they were doing when I first got here. And in the nursery, they wouldn't have been in the service, and they wouldn't be a part of the body. They'd be isolated out there. But then later, we would just bring them all in, 
when the uh, institution, when we, when we would begin to uh, administer the table, we would bring them in for that portion. I remember Joey also had the conviction that we shouldn't, and we shouldn't, separate uh, the word from baptism either. And so he didn't like the idea of, of taking pictures of, of just a baptism or videotaping, because parents often would want to have videotapes and so forth, videotaping that baptism without videotaping the whole service. He wanted the whole service videotaped. So if you're going to videotape it, do the whole service. That way the word and the worship will be also there with that and will be isolated. Uh, so anyway, that was his conviction. Yes, uh, Bridget. Okay. That's, that's a good question. Um, actually, our Book of Church Order and Westminster also has provision for that. Uh, but we wouldn't do, go and do it privately. What we would do is we would go with as large a segment of the church as we can, at least as, as much as the, the hospital will allow us to get in there, so that we still have the body present. And then we would still have you know, a reading of scripture and, and we'd minister it that way. And also, of course, remind the person who wanted it that of the fact that it's not giving them anything different than what they could get in another means of grace. Uh, it's not the magic bullet or whatever that's going to get them to heaven. They, they can't trust it in, in, in that way. But if they see it the way that they ought to see it, it still is a great blessing. And, and yes, they, they can be served in that way. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and end there. We'll you know, hold on to that, uh, to that handout and we'll cover the section about frequency next time. Okay, are there any leftover questions? Um, Tom? Oh. Yeah, I, I can't understand how uh, the, the priest, when he raises up that cup, and that's a lot of easy cut, that uh, what he is doing is summoning Jesus to come down to his church and to be eaten uh, and so forth. And I can't understand how much power do people think that the priest has that he can raise up the cup and then Jesus has he has to come down. I'm just saying, what if Jesus didn't want to come down? But uh, of course that didn't come up under uh, discussion, but you know, raise, raising that cup in my knowledge and do something with Jesus to come down what did he eat? I say, well when it's all eaten up, then what do you do? It depends on when they consecrate it. Um, the pr I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure exactly how they conceive it of Jesus coming down. I do know what they believe is that those elements are actually transformed right there, so that it becomes His flesh and His blood, the elements, and they believe because it is the body and blood of Christ that they should be worshipped. Um, that that um, raises an interesting question too, doesn't it? Because um, once Christ was crucified and, and those few days that he was dead, would we consider worshiping the dead body? Because that's what they're worshiping is, is his body and his blood. Uh, and that's really not the divine part of them. It's a divine person that we're worshiping, not a body. So even if it is transformed into his body and blood, should it be worshiped? Now the idea is they do worship it, okay? And that's when, when he holds it up and venerates it in this way and when the people you know, kneel and bow down before it and so forth, they believe that they're worshiping Christ by worshiping the presence of his physical flesh and blood. But I think it's a, it's a very good question. Even if it were, if it actually was present, should it be worshiped? Christ is the one who is to be worshiped, the person, not his body. Jan, did you? It all goes back to the erroneous view of the infusion, the righteousness. That that is true. They don't want to lose it. Um, I, I don't know if they worship it because of the grace that's in it. Because if that were the case, they'd worship the water too. Do they worship the water? And I wonder if the priests would would tell them to do that. I don't think so, because his body and blood is not miraculously brought into the water. Really? Hmm. 
could be interesting, you know, and I'm wondering why they don't believe that there's some kind of transubstantiation going on in the baptismal waters, too. I mean, why not turn it into literal blood? It's the blood of Christ that cleanses from sin. And Maybe they... Well, they, they definitely believe that they're doing something that nobody else can do except another consecrated priest. I don't know if you saw the old black and white Luther movie, but they tried to portray something of what Luther was experiencing when he was consecrated a priest, and then he celebrated the first mass, as it were, and how you know it's, it's you know the blood of Christ, and he's just trembling as he holds it, you know, thinking that it's it's actually here, you know, it's actually being done in the, in the, the body of Christ, and. He was just looked like he was just going to collapse under the the weight of that, uh, just the seriousness of that whole thing. Of course, later um, didn't hold exactly to that view. I mean, he he did later believe that it was ridiculous that these elements changed, but he still believed that the body and blood was present. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other comments, why don't we close here? We'll pick up. Uh, we're going to get into transubstantiation uh, probably next week, and and uh, it's going to be central in what what the remainder of the confession says here about the Lord's Supper, but we'll also look at, uh, at frequency, okay? But let's uh, bow in a word of prayer.